for those of you who are joining now um, for SBR, and if they do not have some information, so we are going to have a short introduction and orientation about, uh, you know, this exam paper ACC SBR strategic business reporting. Um, we'll discuss about the syllabus, which many of you people already know, exam format, some of you know, some of you do not. Some preparation techniques we'll talk about. <clears throat> uh, I mean, an overall general discussion and it's just like, you know, setting up our plan of this next 10 weeks, 11 weeks journey. What are we going to do? How are we going to do? So the, today is that orientation, planning, whatever you may call it formally or informally. Um, let me just tell you, my uh, first, my opinion about this exam paper, SBR, Strategic Business Reporting. Um, of course, this is an extension of your ACCA F7 financial reporting. So you do financial reporting in F7, then you move to advanced level and you do SBR. So the same, um, you know, path is, is financial reporting based on IFRS. Um, this is one of the most important exams or most important papers or syllabus areas of ACCA. Um, I suggest, I mean, a lot of students, I know that they actually are aiming at or looking at passing the exam. Uh, I would suggest that you should set your goals a little bit higher. It's not only about passing the exam because this is the area, the knowledge area, which most of you will be applying in your daily life on daily basis, in your work life on daily basis. Like, I mean, I know that we uh, either you guys will go to audit firm or you will work in industry, but in any case, it is related to accounting. Uh, finance comes a little later in your career. Most of you people are related to accounting and reporting. And when it comes to accounting and reporting, you have to deal with IFRS. And SBR is actually the area where um, if you are a student and you will finish qualification, you go for job interview, this is the area where most questions will be asked. If you are already working, I'm sure you are working in the accounting department. This is the area which teaches you the most relevant knowledge to apply at work. So this is like, it's not only about passing the exam. It is about getting yourself ready for your, you know, work life, your job life. So this paper is really very, very, very important for me. Um, and of course, for all of you. Okay, now... Um, now you have actually, if you have finished your uh, skills level, like from until F9, so most people, when they come to strategic professional level, um, they start with SBR. A lot of people, they start with SBR. I also suggest them that either you start with AFM or you start with SBR. Starting with SBR is actually um, a good option it's a good option because you already have some knowledge from F7 and you use that knowledge somehow in preparation here as well. But the perspective of the exam, it changes entirely. So if you people have not taken any exam paper in strategic professional, you just have finished your skills level. If you remember that in skill level, you had section A, 20 MCQs, section B, three OTQs type of things, scenario-based OTQs. Um, so a lot of multiple choice, A, B, C, D, and so on. And then when you go to section, you used to go to section C, which had two 20 marks questions. Again, a lot of calculations and numbers and very little expression. The discussive writing part or, you know, the writing skills were not really involved in that part. But when you come to strategic professional here, if you ask me in SBR, um, the number, the calculation part is like 30, 35%, or you can call it hardly 40%, which I don't think so. It should be 30, 35%. And 65 to 70%, it goes to uh, interpretation and, you know, discursive style of writing. So you have to analyze the situation and you have to interpret and evaluate. And then, you know, how to say... Uh, provide your answer 
uh, with reference to the accounting treatment, what the company, how did they do it, how they should have done it. And uh, it's more about the interpret application of the IFRS. It's more about the application of IFRS. Focus is not really on calculating the numbers. Like when you were in F7, the question was calculate the non-current lease liability, calculate the finance cost, or calculate the current total lease liability, or you know what goes to the income statement in with respect to research expenditure. That's all. So it was more about calculation of numbers. Here, it is more about the correct accounting approach, the correct accounting treatment, which a company should adopt. So you need to have good writing skills. Of course, improving or enhancing your writing skills, it's a time-taking process. Some of you people are already good in writing and some of you people, probably a lot of you, you struggle with the writing skills. Okay, you know, I can do calculations, but I'm not really very good in writing. Um, you are actually, uh, you do not need some super writing skills, okay? Because you're not going to write some uh, novel here. You're not going to write some uh, business article here. It is just about a scenario. So if you understand correctly that what I'm expected to write, then you will say, oh, this is not a big job. This is not a big deal. I can do that much. The only thing is that we have a, a wrong perception about the discursive writing part because you think or a lot of people that think that they have to write something out of the box. They have to, you know, do, you know, they have to fancy something. You have to imagine something. Nothing is like that. All you have to write down is about the accounting treatment in the given scenario. So if you are good with IFRS, and if you are especially good with the conceptual framework, especially good with the conceptual framework, because a lot of students, they pay less attention to conceptual framework, and therefore IFRS comes difficult to them. So they say, oh, conceptual framework, because it looks like theory, so they just move on, which is a mistake. So if you have a good understanding of conceptual framework <clears throat> and then a good understanding of IFRS, you see a scenario, you see a situation, and you immediately understand that what should be the accounting treatment. If the company had already done something and if they have, if they have done it wrong, you can say that, oh, I know they have done wrong. I give you a very simple example from your past knowledge. You know from your F7 that development expenditure will be capitalized, research expenditure will be expensed in the profit and loss. You know this thing. So when you see the scenario and you see that the company has capitalized the research expenditure, that's a mistake. Or the company has, you know, um, expensed out in the PL the development expenditure. Instead of taking it to the balance sheet, they have taken it to the PL. This is from F7 level knowledge. I'm just giving you a simple example. You immediately understand. So now what you need to do, you only have to, because you already know that they have made a mistake in the accounting treatment, you start creating your response, making reference to the standard that according to IS 38, intangible assets, research expenditure should go there, development expenditure should be capitalized and so on. So you start giving words to your thoughts. You start giving words to your thoughts regarding that accounting treatment in a logical manner, making references with the accounting standards or making reference with the conceptual framework, that's all. I have a four step model for that discursive response. Um, if you guys have seen my lecture videos when I was, where I solved these questions, I always, whenever I pick up a question, I say, this is the same four-step model. What are you going to write down in para one, para two, para three, para four? Or you can say that part one, part two, part three, part four. The same four-step model will apply to all discursive questions. Uh, this is where a lot of people, they find it challenging SBR exam. Oh, I have to write. You have to write, but it's not difficult. The only thing is that when you start thinking that uh, I don't know what do I have to write, you have you don't have to write anything else other than the accounting standard and the correct accounting treatment or the wrong accounting treatment with relation to that standard. Once you have the knowledge about the standard, 
everything else becomes clear because it comes to your mind, what should I do? IFRS 16, sale and lease back. If that particular transaction is sale and does it justify sale and lease back or not? So you decide it in your mind, you have some arguments, why does it justify or why does it not justify? Now you just have to give it words and put it on paper, that's all. Anyways, um, a little bit about SBR. The challenging part is going to be that discursive writing. Uh, to make it easy is like to have to, you have the correct approach and 60, 65%, maybe 70% marks will go there. Okay, now SBR exam is actually divided into two sections. You've got section A and you've got section B. Okay, let me write down A and B. And you have two questions here and you have two questions here. Two questions of 25 marks here, two questions of 25 marks here. The good part about SBR is that in section A, one question is going to be for question number one is going to be from consolidation and question two will be some other standards scenario based, but ethics can also come here. So at least these are the two things I know that they are going to be tested. So 25 marks straight will go for consolidation. So it means that I don't know other standards, which standards will come, but at least consolidation 25 marks are there. So I really need to work on this part, consolidation and ethics possibly will be here. And then there are two more questions here. And again, multiple standards will be there. This one question might involve two or three parts, part A, part B, part C, and, and they might be, and they probably would be checking you with different standards. What my experience with SBR is that XBR does not test your knowledge in great depth in terms of calculation. It does not. It does not require you to provide complex calculations. Like if I compare SBR with the previous paper P2, you know, uh, this SBR name is there for the last four years before we used to call it P2. P2 had complex calculations and very little writing stuff. Now calculations are not very complex, uh, but writing is required more. Number one thing you need to remember. Number two thing you need to remember that SBR also does not actually ask you very difficult accounting treatment. It does not, it does not go very deep. So I say that it's not very deep. It does not have depth, but it has a lot of breadth. A lot of breadth means that a lot of standards will be checked. Not at a very technical level, but in a certain situation. Uh, I'll give you an example. If you will go to our course page in your IFRS 9, under IFRS 9 standard, there is one question video, one question which I have solved. Um, and the video is there. That one question is for, if I'm not mistaken, eight or nine marks, either eight marks or nine marks. But that one question actually it actually involved IAS 37, which is provision, IAS 16, which is PPE, IFRS 9, which is financial instruments, and IAS 2, which is inventory. One eight mark question. And trust you me, none of these topics are tested in depth. The very basics of these things. But, but what is important that when you read the scenario, you should be able to identify that does it have something to do with IS2 inventories or does it have something to do with IS37 provisions? Am I going to create some provision here or not? And uh, if you find out that yes, then it's just two lines you have to write about it because overall it is eight marks. So it does not require you to write down a long write-up on IFRS 9 some topic. There were only two or three lines for each one of them making reference that, okay, because of this scenario, this is a transaction and this part we should be treating under inventory, this thing we should be treating under PPE, this goes IFRS 9, and this goes to IS 37 and so on. So what I'm, what I'm trying to focus at that you will not find 
it will not happen that there is a 10 mark question on investment property. It will not happen. Or there is a 12 mark question on PPE. It is not, it, it will not happen. You will not find anything. If there is an eight or 10 mark question, that definitely would require knowledge of multiple standards in one situation. Because this is what happens in real life, exactly. This is what happens in real life, exactly. That every event or transaction is going to have impact on multiple areas of profit and loss or on the balance sheet and making reference with different IA standards. So, so the good news is that it's not really very technical paper, if you ask my opinion. SBR is definitely not a very complex or technical paper for sure. That's a good news. The bad news is that you cannot make um, you know, you cannot leave any topic. You have to go through the entire syllabus because in that eight mark question, you should, you need to know this part, this part, this part, this part, only then you will be able to answer it. So good thing is it's not very complex. Bad thing is you cannot leave anything. You have to cover the entire syllabus, okay? Uh, you need to do some practice on writing you will be submitting assignments. We have uh, kind of six or eight assignments uh, which we will uh, give you so that we evaluate your writing skills. Uh, we try to help you in improving your writing skills. Um, again, answer has to be concise. One more uh, misconception I would like to uh, address here. A lot of students, they think that I have to write long. You don't have to write long. ACCA never says that provide a detailed answer. ACCA says provide a concise answer. Concise means that, you know, you have to touch everything. I tell you, um, I've been teaching this SBR before it was P2 and another alternative DIP IFR since 2000 and seven nonstop. So it's almost like 15 years. It has never been a month in my life when I've never taught this thing. So I teach it 12 months a year. And I can tell you with all my honesty that the highest scorer students, highest scorer students were those who had that ability to write it short. If you can write something short and you still address everything, you will get the maximum marks. There are five points which have to be addressed. Let's suppose one particular question requires you to address five points. One student address these five points in 120 words. Another student addressed these five points in 160 words. This one will get more marks. Because remember that you, when you are doing strategic profession or whether it is SBR or AFM, now this is what I'm going to tell you now. This rule will apply not only to SBR, but it will apply to SBL, to AFM, to APM, to SBR, everything. Remember when you were doing your F7 or F9, they said you in the exam question, you are an accountant and you are making this thing. So your role is as an accountant. You have to think like an accountant. But when you come to strategic professional level, you are already a manager or you are a CFO or you are a finance director or you are, you are a consultant, you are an auditor, you have a senior role. And you are reporting to the CFO, to the CEO or to the board. So imagine, first you need to understand that who you are and who are you talking to. You are a manager or even a finance director and you are reporting to the board. So it should be very clear and to the point. You know, in my workplace, I remember that if somebody used to, if I ask someone one question which could have been answered in two lines. Why would I listen for him for five minutes? Or why should I read a long document for something which could have been explained in a short way? So remember in business at work life, 
or in professional life, the shortest answer is the best answer. You are talking to your CEO. Do you think that he is such a free man? He is sitting there and reading your long, 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 long write-ups. Nobody has that much of time. I want you, I always liked those people in my team who could answer my question in the most simplest and shortest way without making things complicated, without repeating the same things. If you have said it in the first para, there is no need to repeat it or twist it again in the second paragraph. So I want you to begin your answer from where it should begin and end your answer where it should end. And keep it logical, keep it to the point, no repetition, no twisting of words, and do not make it unnecessary long. The shortest answer is the best answer. So your approach in all of these strategy professional papers should be that it has to be concise. Concise means that it is complete and it is brief. It is complete, like you have touched all the areas, and it is minimum possible words you have used. You will not um, tire yourself and you will not make other people tired of reading or listening to you. I remember that uh, now with, with all my honesty and without any exaggeration, I had a um, few people in my accounting teams. Now I'm not going to take the name. Um, let's call them X and Y. X was responsible for something and Y was also re responsible to, for almost the similar job. I never asked Y to come to my room because I know that if Y would come in, he would like destroy my, uh, how to say, frame of mind because he would start speaking unnecessary things. So I always ask reporting from X, okay, you come and tell me, you come and tell me. He was telling me his own work and even the work which Y was doing because that guy had this capacity to walk in my room and uh, speak very straight and finish the thing in three minutes and go out. But when Y used to come in and he would start from there and then going there and then going there and not coming to the point and please tell me what do you want to say? So please, this is the approach you have to take in all of these papers. So writing long is not the objective. Writing to the point uh, touching all the necessary points, like making reference to the conceptual framework, making reference to the standard, making re reference to the part of the standard which is involved in the scenario, uh, the treatment which has been done wrong, the correct treatment which we should do, the effect on the PNL, the effect of the balance sheet, and that's all. Finish. Move on. So, anyways, uh, writing part is important, and you have to. It's not about writing long. It's about writing concise and to the point. And this is what we will be teaching you. Uh, when you will come to, okay, so standards. Uh, most of the standards which you will see in your SBR, um, they are almost the same which you have done in your financial reporting FR as well. Like IS-16, PP, IS-40, uh, investment property, 37 provision, 38 intangible, 36 impairment, 21 foreign exchange, government grant, government subsidy, 20 events after the reporting period, IES 10. They are all the same. And then IFRS 9, financial instrument, 15 revenue, 16 leases. Again, they are all the same. Uh, but the depth is different. For example, IFRS 9, was very simple in F7, but it is very complex or quite complex in SBR. IFRS 16 leases had the a little bit more uh, detailed in SBR with a different approach. The new standards which you will find out here would be IS 19, employee benefit, IFRS 2, which is share-based payment. Um, I can say that, or maybe segment reporting was not in, segment reporting was also not in F7, I think. It is again here in SBR. But primarily, these are the two standards which are totally new for you. Otherwise, those other standards like investment property and PPE and intangible, tangible, so on, you will find them here. But um, two things will happen. Number one, the depth will change. And number two, um, 
the focus will change. For example, IS 37, which is like uh, provisions, contingent asset and contingent liabilities was very simple in F7. But, and of course it was not very important in F7, but when it comes to SBR, IS 37 will become one of the most important standards for this exam. Now, can you say that IS 37 was the most important standard in F7? No, it was not. But in SBR, it is the same standard with a little bit more depth and it becomes much more important. Similarly, if you remember that you had PPE, IS 16, property, plant and equipment, and you had IS 38 intangibles. So when you were doing F7, this one was more important and this was less important. You guys have prepared financial reporting. Intangible asset, there was one question, PPE, there were five questions, calculating depreciation and that and that. So PPE was very important in, S, in, in, in F7. And intangible was less important. But in SBR, this thing changes. Here, IS38, it becomes much more important than IS16 itself. So like I said that, some of the, a lot of standards are same, but the depth and the focus will change. So if you ask me in SBR, I have, please give me a choice. I can do either PPE or intangible. I can do only one. Either I do tangible assets or intangible assets. Which one should I do in SBR? I say leave PPE and go for intangibles. This is, I mean, if I had to make a choice, 38 is much more important than 16. So focus will change. Uh, of course, then we know that some standards are more important, some are less important and so on. So this is, um, okay. So I know that almost the same syllabus, like the same standards you will see uh, with two new standards or three new standards in SBR, but, these stand and, but many of these standards will become more important like IFRS 9 in great detail. IFRS 16 has more detail. IFRS 15 is one of the most important standards for the purpose of SBR. So if you ask me, give me three more important, most important standards for SBR, one of them would be 15 revenue. One of the most important standards, revenue. Uh, anyways, so syllabus is there, we understand. Exam is four questions of 25 marks each. Question one is consolidation. Question two is ethics. Question three and four will be from multiple accounting standards. Uh, there are only four professional marks available. Um, so if you go to other professional papers like SBL or AFM, what happens that in SBL AAP or, a or um, SBL or even in AFM, what you have, you have 80 technical marks and 20 professional marks. Technical marks means that marks which are related to the syllabus area itself and 20 professional marks. Professional marks means your presentation and the quality of your overall response. How uh, did you produce your response? It's not about the knowledge of the syllabus area. It's about the ability to answer in a more coherent, logical, simple way. So this is professional marks are there uh, in SBL and AFM. But when you come to SBR, 96 marks are your technical marks and only four marks are your professional marks. And you don't need to do something extra for that. Okay, what are you doing today? Today I'm studying on professional marks. No, you, you don't have to do anything extra. You just follow the logical sequence of your response, you get professional marks by itself. So professional marks is built in. Um, so anyways, you, you need to remember only four professional marks are available. Uh, one more thing which they have done in SBR exam. Um, let me tell you a little bit of history and you would understand the purpose. Uh, when we were doing P2, like five years ago, now we have it here called SBR. So in P2, what happened, 
that there were a lot of calculations. So part A was making a consolidated statement of financial position. And you literally had to prepare a balance sheet here, a consolidated balance sheet, which include parent, subsidiary, another subsidiary, and the group. And you started you know, preparing a complete balance sheet. Complete balance sheet you were making in P2 which was a tough question for 40 marks. And it required a lot of complex calculations. Then they said, we are moving to SBR, strategic business reporting, and preparation of such type of balance sheet is not needed at all. So in SBR, you didn't make a balance sheet, but they gave you some group accounting situation in which there are three or four events and they would ask you that how these events should be reported in the parent's book, how this event should be reported in the consolidated statement of financial position, what impact it would have, and so on. So instead of preparing one complete balance sheet, they gave you one, two, three, or four events. And you have to explain that this event, how it should be reported in the group accounts. So there was a, like a 180 degree shift there was like a 180 degree shift of a lot of numbers, a lot of numbers to a lot of writing. So when they were making P2, so people like me or others who are working in the industry, we said that, oh, you are asking SCCA, you ask people to make a lot of calculations. Today we don't need because we've got accounting softwares, accounting systems to produce all these numbers. We, we don't want people to work as accounting clerks. We need people managers, accounting managers. So you are asking this job, which is like not the job of a manager. They said, okay, so let's remove the numbers and take them to the writing. So from one extreme, they went to another extreme. From a lot of numbers, they went to writing. So we made a complaint about this. We said that, you know, there is salt is very little and they threw the whole thing into it. They've made it a lot of salty. So they went to writing thing. So from one extreme to another extreme, this is what happened in SBR. But in last semester, what they have done, they have come up with a change in this consolidation question. They said, okay, not too much of numbers and not too much of writing. We go back to that balance sheet idea. We go back to that balance sheet idea. But instead of preparing the balance sheet, we will give you that this is the balance sheet which has already been prepared and you need to find out the wrong accounting treatment. Now they are going back to the balance sheet thing, which they left before. So you are going back to the balance sheet again, but you don't ask them to prepare a balance sheet. You are given a pre-populated balance sheet, which is already which has been prepared. And you need to find out the wrong accounting treatment and make the corrections. So now that is something which is in the middle. Like I said that, when it was P2, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, calculations. When they moved to SBR, they left all the calculation and made it a lot of theory. And now they have found out a middle way, which involves some calculations and some writing skills. So this has this is a change. Uh, it happened from the last semester, uh, but it's not really very challenging, and it will happen in your. Part A of question number one. So this change does not apply to all of the exam. This change applies to question number one consolidation and within consolidation only part A. So you are given a pre-populated financial statement and then there is a scenario which you read and some events and accounting adjustments which you will take care and then make corrections or suggestions for that financial statement. It's not really very difficult, but at least you have a look or you have a feel that I am, you know, doing something with the balance sheet itself. Okay, so this is about exam structure, exam style, and so on. Okay, if I come down to the course, which you people have already registered, the first section is about demo parts. You will just ignore it. You don't need it. 
uh, resources you will go. Uh, please, if you have not uh, created a study plan, watch this video, uh, customize study plan. It is very important that you create your own plan, okay? So you will mention your course beginning date, course end date. I'm starting on 23rd of December. I want to finish on 20th of February, 2024. And you will pick up the type of lessons. You want to watch question videos, lecture videos, quizzes, tests, or you want to do everything or some of that. Pick up your videos and create your plan. So this is the video how to make the plan. From this thing, you will actually make the plan. It is It shows the link, okay? So if you pay attention, it shows the video icon, but it shows you the coding icon. So here you will create your plan. And then from here, you can download thing. You have got notes here. Uh, how to use the Vertex portal. Again, another video you can see making assignments and other and other. Those of you people who do not want to make your own plan, which I recommend you should, but if you are too lazy to make your own plan in three minutes, you don't have those three minutes at all, not absolutely three minutes in your schedule, then you can use the standard study plan. There is a PDF file which is given standard study plan. I will remove this one. It should not be December. You should be using this one, March study plan. Thank God I just noticed it. I will ask the team to remove this part. So you will use your March study plan. It is already prepared by Vertex. You can download it, follow it. If you do not have a good plan, what will happen that you will be like 15 days or three weeks from exam and still half of the syllabus is left. So please follow the plan, okay? Um, when you create your own study plan, uh, how should you create exam plan? I don't want you to study every day, okay? Every day studying is very boring. I don't want to study every day myself. We've got other things to do in life and sometimes we've got better things to do in life than studying SPR. Um, I mean, family is there, work is there, friends are there. So you have to take everything, you know, in line. I would suggest you to study four days a week, minimum. You can make it five, but not more than that, either four or five. Three is less, six is too much. No need to study six days. SBR is not the only thing in my life. I've got other things to do as well. So either four days or five days. But, but. Uh, and you have to study minimum two hours in a stretch. Minimum two hours in a stretch. Don't make a schedule, okay, I will study 30 minutes in the morning, then I'll study 30 minutes in the afternoon and one hour in the evening. There is no use of that. You have to do two hours straight in one stretch so that you train your mind, you train your mind to take that workload, to develop yourself, you have that, Ability to concentrate, ability to focus for one stretch of two hours minimum. And that will give you benefit. Now, I know that there are some boys here sitting in this class as well. Boys, they used to go to gym. I know that many, very few, they continue like myself. I also went to gym to 100 times in my life for one weekend, then I stopped. I know there are a lot of people like me as well. In any ways, when you go to gym and if you have to you know, increase your muscle size, you do some weight training or something. I don't know, whatever. Imagine that if I'm doing weight training, I say, okay, I will lift it three times and I leave. I come back, I do it three times and I leave. Then I drink water, I come and do it three times and I go drink water. Will it give any benefit? It will not. If I really want to do it, I have to do it 10 times. Because when I do it 10 times, then I'm pushing myself and my body and my muscles and whatever, and that will develop. Similarly, if you study for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, it will not give you any benefit. Make a schedule of four days or maybe five days. And every time when you set up a schedule, put two hours in a row so that your mind gets, um, you know, uh, accustomed to keeping focus and concentration because this is what you need to do in exam as well. I know a lot of students, they go to exam, exam is three hours and 15 minutes. And after one hour or after two, two hours, they get exhausted. 
their ability to read and understand it just fades away. They just want to finish it and leave the exam room. I know. A lot of students just want to get rid. The last one hour, they are just doing it, you know, getting rid of that because they cannot read. They cannot, they can read, but they cannot understand. Their comprehension ability is not there after an hour and a half. Their energy level is zero almost. So please, um, during these next 10 or 11 months, weeks, not only that you are gaining your technical knowledge, you are actually um, training your mental skills or abilities to get ready for that three hours, 15 minute exam. Um, in my perspective, you've got uh, three things, okay? One is the process where you are learning. Learning is that part where you are going to watch all of these videos and you will read the note, your study text or you will, I don't want you to read study text. I want you to read the notes from Vertex. There is no need to waste 700 time, waste time on 700 pages long study text. This is 200, 180 pages. This is enough. Read notes, that's all. So first part is learning, which includes watching the videos and reading the notes, etc. Second is your, you know, uh, part which is about preparation, preparing for exam. Preparing for exam is where you are doing questions yourself. So when you are watching my videos, you are just learning. You are not preparing yourself. You are learning. Preparing yourself, prepare, preparation means that you are doing questions yourself. And the last part is testing. You go through the mock exam, you go through the other things, and you take a full mock exam and see, can you do it in three hours or not? A lot of students, they go to exam, they come back and they say that I was short of time. I couldn't finish the exam. So you were not actually short of time, you were slow. You were slow. Because when you were doing practice at home, you never keep a watch with you. You used to do questions, but you never realized that a question which should have been done in 30 minutes at home while doing practice, you were doing it in 50 minutes. So your speed was adjusted to 50 minutes. When you went to exam, you started doing it for 50 minutes. Exam only gives you 30 minutes for that question. So while practicing yourself, preparing yourself, you need to keep a watch or a clock with you and see if you can really do it in the prescribed time or not. So learning is only one part. You know, a lot of students, I know that they say that, okay, I watched all the videos, I read the book, I went to exam, but I couldn't pass because you only focused on the learning process, which is one part of the overall program. Uh, activity. Learning, then comes preparation. Preparation is where you are doing yourself enough practice, keeping the watch and clock with you and making sure that you do it in the prescribed time. And then you do testing yourself. You need to do testing in mock exam, taking mock exam. So once you do a lot of testing, like you have quizzes here, you have progress test too. So we've got here quizzes for every chapter. I know SBR is not a quiz or MTQ based subject, but I do give quiz so that I can see your technical knowledge in a very quick way. So you have quizzes, you have progress test one, you will have progress test two, you will have progress test three, and you will have final mock exam. Mock exam, and then here is your ACC exam. Now, if any one of you takes progress test one, and it is pass. Progress test two, it is pass. Progress test three, it is pass. Mock exam, it is pass. Final exam, what it could be or what it should be. Logically speaking, it should be pass. But if you take progress test one, fail. Progress test two, fail. Progress test three with me, fail. Progress mock exam with me, fail. How do you expect to do a miracle? What is the logical sequence coming here? Fail. It cannot happen. Fail, 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 boom, pass. Miracles do not happen. Or if 
you take progress test one pass, in two, you fail, in three, you did not take, mock exam, you pass, I don't know what is going to happen here. So please build a pattern, okay? Whatever we do, we have patterns to follow. Things happen in pattern. So make a pattern, success, make success as your pattern. And like I said, learning, which means watching the videos, reading the book, practicing yourself, which means, so this is the learning phase. This is the preparation phase in which you are doing question. And finally, this is the testing phase. If you give your equal amount of time, for example, the total time needed here is approximately 160 hours maximum with 100% pass assurance. If somebody asks how much time do I need to give to SBR to pass it fully, I would say 160 hours and you are sure short pass. Yeah, you can. some of you can manage with 140 hours as well, but 160 is for everyone sure short pass. Out of that, approximately 70 to 75 hours will go there, maximum. Approximately, you can say that 60 hours should go to preparation, you're practicing yourself, and then what goes to testing, another 10 to 20 hours can go to testing, 15 to 20 hours of testing. Because you need to give answer, mock exam and review it yourself. I know what most people they do. A lot of people will give 70 hours here. Oh, Mr. Ali, I'm so fascinated by your videos. I've watched all of your videos. I say, thank you very much. But then how much preparation did you do? Only 15 hours. I mean, is your objective to watch my video? Instead of watching my video, you should have gone and watched some Tom Cruise movie. You probably would have spent better time. My video watching is not your objective. You only watch my video so that you can do preparation. If you don't do preparation, don't watch my video. If you are not practicing questions yourself, you should not have spent time on this either. So what do they do? They do 70 here, they do 15 here, and they take one final mock exam in three hours. That's all. And they say, I'm going to pass exam. You don't. And that's why ACCA pass rate is only 50 or 51% for this exam. Because most people, they, fo they follow this thing. Most people, they will follow this thing. Please do not focus a lot on videos and very little because you, you are going out of proportion. Don't go out of proportion. My question videos and lecture videos, all, all of them together should be more 60 to 75, 70 to 75 hours. Actually, currently there are 90 hours, but I'm going to remove some of the videos to make it more reachable. There are 90 hours plus videos on your course page on this SBR course page, and I'm going to remove some of them. I only want to put the, the ones which are, you know, essential ones, because some videos are repeating. Repeat, repetitive means that I did a question and then another question, another videos. It's almost a very similar question. There is no new learning point. So you watched a video, you learned something new. Then you go to the second video, you start watching it. And the things which are coming, you already understand them. And you are waiting, maybe something new is going to happen. Maybe something new is going to happen. You spend 25 minutes and nothing ha new happens. It's the same thing. So this part, this video, I'm going to take away. So that you should not be spending the same thing, okay? Time on the same thing. So 70, 75 hours of learning. 60 hours of preparation yourself. And by the way, I'm sorry. Here you should add some... Uh, 20 hours of reading the book. Okay, let me just correct it. Uh, videos, learning as actually 70 to 75 hours of videos plus 20 hours of reading. So that makes me 90. And this is preparation, which is another 60. And this is testing with approximately 15. And I make a total, it makes me 155 hours maximum. 160, I said maximum. Maybe you can spend 5, 10 hours here, there. This is you should be doing. If you are not doing preparation, if you are not doing practicing of 60 hours yourself, please don't go to exam. Don't go to exam. Exam cannot be, it's not like, okay, oh, you know, I just took the exam in the morning. Let's see, let's pray what happens. So you come out of the examination hall 
and you started thinking like, let's see what happens. Let's pray to God. You know, it's not good. You are not doing gamble. Okay, I throw the coin and let's see whether it is heads or tails. You are going to exam. You should pass. You should pass. Yeah, you might get more, you might get less, but at least you should pass. And this is the recipe for passing the SBR. This is the time allocation I have given you. 15 to 20 hours maybe maximum on testing. 60 hours of, prep, of practicing, 90 hours of videos and whatever. And this is the maximum side, maximum side. Some of you people might be ending up in 140 hours because some of the videos you will not watch. You say, I know the concept because you have already done financial reporting. So you will skip some of the videos that, okay, I know this from F7. I know this from F7, okay? Anyways, um, what you have here, make a study plan, follow the plan and follow sequence this thing, conceptual framework and ethical issues. This is here. Uh, revenue, if you come down, there are 19 videos. Like I said that, if you ask me, one of the most important three standards in SBR, one is revenue. So I've done here uh, a lot of question uh, lecture videos you will see, <clears throat> and then you will see question videos. Until here, this is topic videos, one, two, three, four, whatever. From here, the question videos will start, and quite a lot of question videos I have given, okay? Revenue question with explanation, exam question from March 2021, and so on. And then there is a quiz. Please attempt the quiz. I know that SBR is not a quiz-based MTQ or CQ style, but in this quiz, I will check your ability, whether you can calculate discount allocation, can you calculate finance component, can you calculate finance income in revenue, okay? So right to refund, liability, whatever, all part of this thing, and you need to do, do calculation as well. So I check your calculation. You move to non-current assets. It says chapter number 16, uh, chapter number four, 36 lessons. Now, this is all of the non-current assets together. Now, this syllabus or this format, it is based on BPP book. So in order to avoid confusion, I have given the names same as BPP. So if you see 36 lessons, these 36 lessons are on many standards because you will see PPE here uh, and then PPE topic, this one question and quiz, then IS 36 impairment, and then questions and notes for impairment and quiz for impairment, IS 36. Then I first 13, fair value, fair value quiz. Then IS 38, intangible, and then a quiz on intangible. Then IS 40, investment property, and then question and then quiz. So a lot of standards are inside. So chapter four is not about one standard. In chapter four, you've got six or seven standards which are all related to uh, non-current assets grouped together, okay? So this is going to take a lot of time, this one chapter. Yeah, of course, then I have chapter five is IS 19, employee benefit. You've got nine lessons. What do you have inside? You've got here, <clears throat> you know, Introduction, short-term, post-employment, settlement, curtailment, question, 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 and notes. And you move to the next topic. Uh, one more advice, one more or one last suggestion I would give you. Do not rush to complete the syllabus. So if you have done this IS-19 employee benefit, you have watched all of the videos. Please do the practice questions. Read the notes. Do it completely. Kill this topic. In my language, kill this topic. So today is Saturday. And uh, I know that it is 20 and 10, 30, 40, 70, 80, 100, 116. So it is almost like two and a half hours of videos. On this weekend, I'm going to finish this. Saturday, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm going to finish everything today. Or maybe I will finish the video lectures today and I'll watch the question videos tomorrow and I'll do some practice. Once I finish the, with the practice questions, then I move forward. Without doing practice questions from IS-19, I will not go to IS-37. 
So when you say that I have done a topic, oh, I I, I completed IS-19. Completed IS-19, you, you will only say when you have done questions by yourself, at least two questions, one or two questions. So go to the kit, do one question or two questions and then move forward, okay? So this is how you will complete. Uh, any and I mean, it has got a lot of, uh, it's a long syllabus actually. Um, you Like I said, 140 to 160 hours you need to give, but it's not very difficult. If you ask me, among all the professional strategic professional papers, the easiest one is SBR, provided you follow a pattern and uh, you do it a consistent effort week on week basis week on every week approximately 15 hours i'm giving 15 hours per week i give for next 10 weeks 150 hours is its total job done anything you want to ask until here please ask <laughs>